go over some really fun and interesting information regarding why libido is actually good for your health, why it's important. And actually, Jenny, do we have Dr. Holtrup joining us at the end of the call like he often does? Do um, we, poss we possibly can. I'll, I'll check to verify. Okay. That's okay. Either way is fine. But I'm going to allow plenty of time for questions and answers. That's always the most fun part of any presentation, in my opinion. And everyone will always ask the perfect questions and things that I wanted to address. And I'm sure any questions that people have are, it's always a question that somebody else has. So, so I'm, I will leave plenty of time for that, and, uh, and, and we'll go from there. So we're taking advantage of the month of February with Valentine's Day uh, to focus on love and libido and sex and hormones and feeling our very, very best. And uh, so we're going to have uh, some fun this evening together. Uh, this is a cartoon of me. I'm just kidding. It isn't really me. Uh, if you've been with me on other webinars, you've seen the juggling mom Doctor, lady, this is, um, you know, minus the baby bottle. Um, my life looks a lot like this. And so does a lot of our lives, men and women. And um, we get very busy. And what I have found that uh, makes me sad is that people tolerate not feeling great. Um, and that's actually not good for us. Uh, sometimes we think we're doing everybody a favor by attending to them before taking care of ourselves, but uh, you know, there's a reason on airplanes that when, the, when we need oxygen that they have us put our own masks on first before we help other people. Uh, we have to be able to do that. And libido is an area in particular where people really let it slide. <laughs> you know, they put everything else on the to-do list um, before that goes. And um, and actually, what we're going to learn this evening is that uh, libido is really a great indicator of our overall health status. And when I say that, I'm using libido in a, in a broader term than just about sex, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. So this is actually me. I took this picture at my desk. It's not what I'm wearing today, but uh, for those of you that haven't met me, uh, that's me in my office here at Holtorf Medical Group in Foster City. Uh, the main office of Holtorf Medical Group, uh, the main office is in Torrance, and we're just delighted to be Dr. Holtorf's second location. And then, of course, there's other locations springing up all around the country, so we're really, really happy about that. We really do a very um, a really balanced look at hormone health overall, and we help people with all sorts of different conditions. So, so that's me. And uh, one of these days, we'll do the technology so I'm actually looking at you live. Um, well, we don't have that tonight, but that's all right. And so this is a little uh, depiction of all the different areas that we need to look at, really, to feel our best. And I will tell you that my own background is in the medical healthcare arena up on the upper left side of your screen. And I'm, my board certification is in OBGYN. However, over about the last six years or so, I started getting myself uh, into advanced training courses on hormone deficiencies in men and women. And I see patients of all ages. I see uh, kids, teenagers, adults. Um, my youngest patient is seven years old, and my oldest patient right now is a 90-year-old gentleman. And uh, so I have a really wonderful, delightful job helping people with hormone balance and, and really feeling like their best selves and feeling like themselves again. And I'm really passionate about the things that I talk about with my patients about feeling our best because I'm in my late 40s. I have two adolescent boys. I have my full-time job that I love. And I'm also in menopause. And uh, so I really am right in there with uh, a lot of my patients in terms of hormone balancing. And I am personally very lucky. I have a mom who is a doctor. 
She's in her mid-70s, and she's vibrant and sexy and just doing great with her health. And uh, she has always encouraged me to do my best and to not tolerate not feeling well. So as I've had things come up for me, I've really jumped on things. So I've had my moments of feeling um, hormone imbalance symptoms, and uh, I've had the knowledge and the encouragement to actually do something about it. So those of you that are here on this call, that's just, I'm delighted that you're with us tonight uh, because that's already 80% of success that's showing up. So you're here to, to listen to this information and engage in our question and answer session. So we're looking specifically at the topic of libido tonight. And I'm going to share a couple of things with you. And just so you know, this is my first book, and I have the second book in progress. And I'm going to give you information at the end of the talk about staying connected with Holtorf Medical Group and also with me because I'm, I like to include um, the people that I take care of, uh, which includes you all tonight, uh, in my book writing process. So this is my first book. Uh, Dr. Liz's Easy Guide to Menopause, Five Simple Steps to Balancing Your Hormones and Feeling Like Yourself Again. And my second book is in the works, which is essentially on the topic of why women shouldn't be afraid of hormones. Uh, but uh, I'll be putting the word out because I want help coming up with a really good title for that book. So we'll be working on that. I'll give you that information a little bit later. Two things we're going to cover tonight. The first is why libido is important. And the second is how you can use natural approaches to improve your libido. So the first thing that we need to address is the way in which I am using the word libido. I'm using the word libido in the broadest sense of the word. And if you look it up in the dictionary, this is what you'll find you'll see that it actually says things such as life energy, motivation, enthusiasm. Libido includes drive uh, to accomplish things. And this is all in the broad sense of the word. So it's really about a lot more than only talking about sex. It really reflects our state of hormone balance. And also, sex is actually good for our health. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. So that's the first of under the why. So let's dig in on the topic of why is libido important and talking about sex and how sex benefits our health. So how do we know that sex is good for our health? Well, I'll tell you, we know it's from abundant scientific studies and data. We know that sex protects our health. And this is true for men and women. For example, there was a large study with several hundred men that was done. And they looked at frequency of sexual intercourse and risk of dying of cardiovascular causes. The men who have the highest frequency of sex actually had as much as a 50% decrease in cardiovascular mortality compared to the men who have the least frequent sex. So that's dramatic. That's cutting the risk of dying of heart disease in half uh, based on frequency of, of sex. Now, studies have found similar results in women. However, there's a little bit of an additional feature of that, and that is that women, for women, it wasn't entirely only the frequency of sexual intercourse was the frequency of orgasm. So there was quality as well as quantity that was important there. Um, but in any case, we can see that for men and women, uh, it's very, very important uh, and relevant to our health. Uh, also in men, erect health function is a really good indicator of overall cardiovascular health. The same things that damage blood vessels of the heart can damage blood vessels in the genitals. And there was a panel of experts that issued a report in 2005 
recommending that all men starting at age 25, they should at least be asked about erectile dysfunction, whether or not they mention it to their doctors, because it's an, considered an early marker for cardiovascular disease. And research going all the way back to the 1940s from Kinsey studies shows that people with fulfilling sex lives experience less anxiety, they tend to be less violent and hostile, and our world needs less violence and hostility these days. And sex causes, the way that it translates physiologically into less anxiety and less experience of stress is by causing the release of oxytocin, endorphins, and dopamine. And these are all hormones that increase positive feelings, feelings of attachment, affection, closeness. So we have really looked at all of these types of things, and we're going to say a little bit more now about one of the hormones that I just mentioned, which is oxytocin. Oxytocin is really good for us. Oxytocin is released by the brain and affects the entire body, and it is released during sexual activity, especially during orgasm. It's also released during breastfeeding. And it is also referred to as the love hormone or the bonding hormone. And oxytocin itself has been shown to give all sorts of health benefits, including enhancing mood, lowering cortisol, lowering blood pressure, it causes dilation of blood vessels all over the body, which gives glowing skin. And because it's improving blood flow to the organs of the body as well as the brain, it's improving the health of the organs. And there's research that even shows oxytocin being protective against several hormonally mediated cancers. So that's really a lot about the why these topics that we're covering tonight are so very important. The next section I want to talk about with you is the how. Natural approaches to improve libido. Again, in the full sense of the word, sense of well-being, enthusiasm, and joy, experience of joy. So the three major areas we're going to cover are lifestyle, nutrition, and we're going to talk about bioidentical hormone therapy. <coughs> okay. So first of all, there's three things I want to talk about under the topic of lifestyle. The first has to do with having a healthy weight. Now, my interest in this is not cosmetic, and I did not say skinny. Okay, so I am not talking about people living up to some kind of Hollywood uh, Oscar show uh, standard of thinness, but rather my interest in this is because the fact is that when we carry excess fat tissue on our bodies, that fat tissue is not just sitting there. It's actually producing chemicals, it's producing hormones and toxins that disrupt our internal hormonal balance. So being at a healthy weight helps us reach and maintain good hormone balance. And we need good hormone balance to support healthy libido. The second area under lifestyle things that we can do to help our libido are mindfulness practices. And the studies just keep flowing in about the health benefits of all kinds of practices of mindfulness, whether it's yoga, prayer, meditation. And especially with, you know, I showed that cartoon of the woman juggling all these different things. We have these overscheduled lives. And any kind of mindfulness practice that you do will benefit your health and your hormone balance. So if you're not already doing that, if you add even five minutes a day to your busy life, 
of any of those kinds of practices, research has shown that it will benefit your health. And the third major area under lifestyle has to do with getting enough sleep. Now, I really believe that this is foundational to all of the hormone balancing work that I do with my patients. And the trend nowadays is do more, sleep less, and handle it by drinking an energy drink during the day or caffeine. And I know a lot of people have to do that. However, it's not sustainable in the long run. The fact is that human beings can go for weeks without food, but we cannot go very long without sleep. So especially for libido, now there, I just repeat this so frequently to my patients, uh, especially to women, the femininity required, the feminine receptivity that women require for intimacy and sexual desire absolutely requires that she be getting enough rest. Uh, we can't, it can't be done on caffeine. It has to be real. And, uh, you know, we can run, but we can't hide from the fact that enough high-quality sleep is really, really important. And it's important for men as well. However, I think that in particular, as I said, as far as feminine receptivity for sex, it's really a deal breaker for women to be getting enough sleep. So that's the first area under lifestyle changes. The second area is nutrition. Now, besides the correct statement that what we eat and go, what we take into our bodies as far as food is becomes the basic building blocks for all of the hormones that we can produce and we can influence hormones with what we eat. In addition to that, there are actually a lot of nutritional supplements that can help with libido. For example, L-arginine and niacin are nutritional supplements that help with blood flow, and there are other nutritional supplements that help with testosterone production. Um, for example, Tribulus, that's in one of the uh, supplements that's in a current giveaway that we're doing right now on the Holter Facebook page for a supplement called Climaxia. And I've had really good feedback from my patients on our supplement called Climaxia, uh, which contains Tribulus, among other ingredients. Um, and I've had good feedback from men and women for, for that supplement. Also, ginkgo biloba can help boost libido. Also, things, herbal supplements and nutritional supplements for women that can help with perimenopausal and menopausal symptoms and can also improve sexual response, such as black cohosh and maca root. So lots of possibilities under the area of nutrition to help improve libido. And the third area that I want to talk about this evening is really my own area of expertise, and this is bioidentical hormones. And so we can go into more detail as people may have questions, uh, but this applies to both men and women. And there are several other webinars that we've done in the past year. Uh, one of our Holtorf doctors, Dr. Sterrett, did a webinar on testosterone therapy for men, which is just excellent. He spent an entire hour talking about that topic. Uh, I did a couple of webinars last year regarding hormone therapy, why women shouldn't be afraid of hormones. And I'm just going to touch real briefly on that this evening. Uh, however, do know that the HoltorfMed.com website has abundant information, including articles and studies. Uh, that really expand a great deal on what I'm only going to talk about briefly this evening. In particular, what I want to touch on is the two major areas that scare people away, that scare women away from using bioidentical hormones to feel their best and support their feeling of well-being and their libido. 
two major areas that scare women away from hormone therapy have, are cardiovascular risks and the fear of breast cancer. And largely, these fears really got rolling about 11 years ago when a study called the Women's Health Initiative started to issue findings. And unfortunately, it's still producing findings from that study. Now, the irony is that that study was undertaken in order to prove that hormone therapy would give cardiovascular benefits. So what I want to give you tonight is just the bottom line on this area. Here's what we now know. All these years later, many other large studies later is this. The increased risk to heart health that the women experienced in that study who were given the hormones, the increase in risk was entirely due to the fact that the estrogen in that study was given by mouth. It was given as an oral estrogen. What we now know is that when estrogen is given to women through their skin, gel, patches, spray, that when estrogen is given through the skin, the risk of heart attacks, strokes, blood clots, things that were increased with oral estrogen, go all the way down to the same level as a placebo. So that's the real important bottom line about cardiovascular risk and hormone therapy for women. The, the biggest area of fear for women from hormone therapy, and we'll talk about the word bioidentical in a moment, has to do with breast cancer. And I understand that fear. I can relate to that fear. My mom, thank goodness, she's doing great quite a few years after having an early stage breast cancer. And so I have experienced that fear. Whenever I go to get my mammogram, I always get just a little nervous. However, here's what we now know. So what the study showed was an increased risk in breast cancer. Most people have heard of that finding. Two crucial things that most people have not heard. The first is that the, the absolute increase of numbers, the absolute risk increase, was very small. It was a relative risk that was reported as very, very significant. The second important thing is this. The increased risk of breast cancer in that study was due to the fact that the women were given a synthetic progestin rather than a bioidentical or natural progesterone. Multiple studies, including a very large European study from only five years ago, has shown that a bioidentical progesterone does not increase the risk of breast cancer. And it confirmed that the synthetic progestin actually does increase that risk. There's also another large US study that confirms that. So it's, it's sad that only scary headlines get attention. That's kind of how our system works, unfortunately. So before I say it, just a tiny bit more about that and then talk about the actual benefits of hormones, and I'll also say a word about hormone therapy for men, is the word bioidentical, because this is really a key concept for our purposes in supporting libido and feeling our best. So. A lot of doctors get a little irritated by the term bioidentical because they think it's just a marketing term. But luckily, all it means is that the form of the hormone is identical to what our bodies used to produce in optimal quantities. And as time goes by and we get older, it's natural for hormone levels to drop. And I love Suzanne Summers. I think she's really neat. And she's sort of the far end of doing hormone therapy all the way to the point of maybe like a 25-year-old. And she's 66 years old now and looks pretty good. Um, however, at least she's gotten this awareness out there and some better acceptance of the word bioidentical. And that is 
whenever I'm talking about hormone therapy, I'm talking about estrogen through the skin and a bioidentical form of progesterone. So we just covered this. Does how a woman uses estrogen make a difference? And the answer is yes. Transdermal is absolutely the preferred way to do that. So there we have just a comment on the sad fact that scary headlines are all that make it into the media. So whenever you have a uh, read something frightening in an article, I encourage you to look more deeply and maybe even look on the wholechargemed.com site to find out a little more detail. There's a lot of really um, excellent reviews of hormone therapy for men and women on our website. For men, just to cover it, I'm going to cover it just briefly for right now, testosterone is such a helpful hormone for men. I know that sounds obvious, but I just really can't emphasize it enough. It's normal for testosterone levels to decline as men get older. And if they're feeling fine, then that's OK. However, low testosterone can be responsible for a long list of health problems that men can have, more cardiovascular disease, erectile dysfunction, all sorts of other uh, related problems uh, that men can be experiencing, mood disorders, irritability, all of these things can be improved for men with testosterone. It's also important to look at a lot of other areas, but we're just a little bit limited on our time tonight. So I just want to look at four areas, four hormones in particular, uh, that I call the big four. And so I'm just going to talk a little bit about that, and then we're going to sort of bring it all together, and then we're going to take questions. Let's see. All right, I'm going to leave that up for a moment while we're talking here about what I call the big four. And those are four hormones. The first one like for women is estrogen. And estrogen is... Uh, Dr. Sarah Gottfried is a doctor up here in the Bay Area who says that estrogen makes us women juicy. And that is absolutely true. It promotes blood flow. The same way that testosterone promotes blood flow for men, estrogen does so for women. And it helps all kinds of symptoms. So temperature, problems, feeling a little private summers uh, that sometimes we women may get. Uh, it helps if temperature irregularity is disrupting a woman's sleep, then estrogen can make a huge difference. Also, estrogen helps with mood. I like how Dr. Holtorf summarizes it. He says that estrogen helps with depression and progesterone helps with anxiety. I like to flip it and say estrogen gives us happy and progesterone gives us calm. So let me move on to number two of the big four, which is progesterone. And the, one of the most important things about progesterone is that natural bioidentical progesterone gives a sedating effect on the brain. And this helps with sleep, it helps with feeling calm, and it balances the estrogen. So I've had many patients where that'll be the first thing that I start with, especially a woman in perimenopause, progesterone's the first thing to go. And so progesterone, it can be either as a cream or as a capsule, can often make a really big difference. I've had a lot of my patients feel a lot better just starting there. And as we said, good sleep in terms is going to help in terms of feeling well and feeling good libido. And the third of the big four is testosterone. And testosterone helps with mood and mental function, both in women and men. A lot of women don't know that, a lot of people don't know that women produce testosterone uh, in our bodies. And so sometimes a symptom that goes along with lower testosterone levels for women is the brain fog. And men describe that as well to me. They say, I'm not as sharp. I have to compete. You know, I'm 50-something years old. I'm in Silicon Valley. I have to compete with men half my age and uh, they really need to be on their game, and testosterone makes a difference with that. 
and more obviously, it helps directly with libido and sex drive. Okay. So again, I don't think it's the main thing for women for sex drive, but it absolutely can help. It can be given as a lozenge under the tongue or a cream for women. For men, it can be a topical gel application or it can be injection. And there's monitoring that we do to make sure we're getting good levels, in addition to people feeling a symptomatic response and just feeling better on it. And the last of what I call the big four is the adrenal hormone DHEA. And DHEA is a quality of life hormone. That's the slide that I have up here, which is a phrase that I always say. Uh, so DHEA is produced by the adrenals. And in men, again, it's, as I said, it's produced by the adrenals. However, for men, testosterone is the major hormone for libido. For women, DHEA is the major hormone for libido. And when we're under chronic stress, our adrenals will prioritize. Now, the adrenal glands make a hormone called cortisol, and we cannot live without cortisol. And that's what keeps us going. It keeps us from falling asleep at the wheel when we're doing a million things on our to-do list instead of getting enough sleep and eating healthy food and getting our hormones balanced. So when we're under prolonged stress, our adrenals will protect us by making more cortisol and less DHEA. So when we manage our stress, make healthy choices, balance our hormones overall, and our adrenals can make more of this quality of life hormone, which is DHEA. And I've had so many patients where replacing and supplementing DHEA makes such a wonderful difference for them. So I am going to draw to a close already, so we have time for plenty of time for questions. And what I really want for everybody is feeling their best. And I want my patients to be able to say, and I want to be able to say something that a patient of mine said to me recently. She said, I feel better now at 50 than I did at 40. And that was such a pleasure to hear her say. And she was talking about overall, her whole life energy, her sense of well-being, in other words, her libido. So if your libido is low and it's an issue in your life, get it checked out. There's a lot that can be done, and it can even save your life. And I want to put this up also for us, which I'll leave up while we're having our question and answer session, which, is, uh, which are a couple of websites, the wholesourcemed.com site that I've mentioned, and also my website, uh, drlister.com. And we each have newsletters. And I have to tell you, we're both really good about not bombarding anybody with emails. Uh, Dr. Holtorf sends out emails on topics occasionally. And occasionally, if there's a new supplement, for example, with the Climaxia, when we introduced that one last year, an email went out. So I recommend being on that list to get the latest updates. And we'll notify, let you know when we're doing classes like this. Uh, on my website, on drlister.com, you can sign up for my newsletter. And again, I send out one, maybe two newsletters in a month, typically, with articles responding to headlines. Uh, and there'll be one going out soon. There's been some very interesting headlines, headlines related to supplements lately. So I'll be sending that out. So I'm inviting you to be on our newsletter list so that we can stay in touch with you. So Jenny, thank you very much for being our fearless tech leader. Yes, we do have questions ready for you, Dr. I'm Lawrence. ready. OK. Um, we'll start off. Um, we have one of our listeners wanted to know how they approach hormone, low hormones and supplementation if they have a history of breast cancer, and doctors won't address it because of that history. Got it. Got it. OK. Uh, okay, so first of all, just FYI, I'm going to probably have an entire chapter on that in my next book. And 
that was the bulk of the webinar called Why Women Shouldn't Be Afraid of Hormones. I covered that a lot. So the person who asked that question, let's make sure you have information to access that webinar that I did in October. But to answer your question, so first of all, I'm so sorry that um, you have your doctors don't even want to go there because the fact of the matter is that the data for hormone replacement therapy for women after breast cancer is really very, very favorable. Um, in fact, there's lots of studies done at specialized medical centers. Uh, and probably what, I, what my theory is is that there were women at those centers that were treated for breast cancer and then just didn't feel well and just demanded to have hormone therapy. And so they agreed because they were able to keep track of them and study them. So there are numerous studies that show improved survival after breast cancer in women actually using estrogen. I know that really sounds like a lot to take in because of how the headlines bombard us with uh, scary uh, information, but that's actually what the Women's Health Initiative study showed as well. The women who were only on estrogen actually had a lower incidence of breast cancer. So the way we approach it is with a very thorough discussion, the theoretical risks that people are concerned about, the I give patients an entire packet that Dr. Holtorf put together that actually has the actual studies that I'm talking about. Um, and so we can actually get those to the person that asked that question. So we can, we can figure that out as well. So that's sort of a brief answer to that question. Did that answer that question, Jenny, do you think? Yes, yes. And uh, kind of along the same lines, we had another patient who was wondering um, if they had an increased uh, risk in breast cancer if they're on some bioidenticals but also on estrogel because they couldn't get relief from their hot flashes with the bioidentical estrogen. Yeah, no problem. That's no problem. Basically, estrogel is bioidentical. It's estradiol. Uh, the most important thing is that it's through her skin and not through, not by mouth. And in either case, even the oral estrogen that did show increased cardiovascular risk showed a decrease in breast cancer compared to placebo. So that's no problem. Feeling right. good is worth it. It's not, there aren't, actually are not health risks to do that. It does not increase risk of breast cancer. OK, you spoke a little bit about sleep. So we have one of our um, listeners was wondering that they, they are hypothyroid and never feels rested after sleeping 10 hours. Right. Any recommendations? Okay, uh, yeah, absolutely. So again, what, what I do when I'm working with my patients is look at a lot of different areas. So talking about sleep quality and if there's any other symptoms. For example, if, if someone's having hot flashes or night sweats and sleep is disrupted, sometimes sleep is not disrupted enough to realize that you're waking all the way up, but hot flashes come from the brain. They're generated by the brain. So there can be disrupted sleep that's causing it to be unrefreshing. Um, there's also other things that can happen with conditions of hypothyroidism that, uh, you know, it's important to be on the right thyroid medication. Also adrenals, uh, and there's also other areas of the immune system and things that can disrupt sleep quality. And uh, so all of that is important. Natural progesterone helps with sleep quality. So these are all, that's kind of an initial answer to that question. OK. And we have another uh, listener who um, states that they're hypothyroid and perimenopausal. And they're mm -hmm. having a hard time trying to figure out if the symptoms like anxiety or sleep are, for, are from either the thyroid or the perimenopause. Is there any way to figure out what is making, having them have those symptoms? Okay. 
Great question. It's an excellent question. So, peri, so menopause is when a woman has gone a whole year without her menstrual period. Perimenopause is up to 10 years, sometimes more, before that actually happens. So up to and including a year or two of a transition time where the periods get further apart and other symptoms start to pop up. So one of the first things that happens is typically when a woman's in her 40s, but I see, I'm, starting, I'm seeing it younger and younger, and that is that the first hormone in women that starts to decline in the quality of the production of quantity is progesterone. And progesterone leads exactly to anxiety and to disrupted sleep. So I see a lot of women who've already been to their own doctor, or the, the primary doctor who gave them something, you know, treated a symptom instead of getting at the underlying cause. So give them a sleeping pill or give them an anti-anxiety pill or an antidepressant where what's underneath the underlying cause is actually a relative lack of progesterone and giving a natural or bioidentical progesterone is an excellent way to start. And there are over-the-counter progesterone creams that are very low dose, usually around 20 milligrams per gram. When I prescribe for my patients, I start at 50 milligrams or go to 100 or even higher doses, um, which are completely safe and can make a huge difference and really help with sleep and, and uh, feeling calm. Okay, great. We have um, a couple of questions. I'm going to try to combine them a little bit, and they do have to do with um, taking estradiol. And one of them specifically said it's a uh, 0.05 milligram of an estradiol at the Vivel patch. And the one question was, is that by itself bad? And the other one is, if they're taking the estradiol with 100 milligrams of bioidentical progesterone, um, is that better, or should they be taking any other form of estrogen besides the patch? And does the, okay, we'll start there. Okay, yeah, that's, that's a huge question. So first of all, um, you know, I don't know if we put this up on the, on the, you know, like a disclaimer, you know, that we're not prescribing or, or telling you what to do with your medications, but to answer generally, uh, I'm, as I mentioned, it's very important that estrogen and progesterone be balanced for women. So estrogen stimulates the lining of the uterus and progesterone stabilizes the lining of the uterus. So when we're having our menstrual cycle, at the end of each cycle when there is uh, ovulation occurs and then there's no pregnancy, the progesterone level drops off and that's what leads to the bleeding and that's the menstrual period. So that's kind of like a super brief, you know, menstrual cycle 101. So they have to be in balance. So the person who is using the patch, that's, that's excellent. It's bioidentical. Um, there's other advantages to using a compounded estrogen gel, which is probably what I do with most of my patients, uh, which I'll talk about in a second. But uh, the 0 0.05 dose of the patch, it is considered that that definitely needs to be balanced with progesterone. Now, two things about that. One is that most doctors are taught that a woman without a uterus doesn't need any progesterone. So that actually is not the case. A lot of women don't feel their best only on estrogen when they, after they've had a hysterectomy. So a little bit of progesterone can be helpful. If she has her uterus, she has to have some progesterone to balance the estrogen. All right. Doesn't have to have it in a cyclic fashion. Doesn't have to have a menstrual period. It's not meant to cause bleeding. It's only enough to help bone protect bones, help with symptoms, uh, that kind of thing. So it does need to be in combination. Does that answer Great. both parts of that question, Jenny? That was, was the more? first part. Yeah, that was great. And then one, uh, the second part again. we'll go to the second part. Yes, but we're going to go to the second part now. Um, does taking progesterone once daily provide proper balancing of estradiol? Usually, yeah, absolutely. I usually have people take progesterone at bedtime because I want the sedating effect on the brain. And the synthetic forms don't do that, only by identical forms, which might be from a regular pharmacy or might be from a compounding pharmacy, but only the bioidentical 
can do the that really nice sedating effect on the brain, and I like to have women do that at bedtime. Okay, great. Almost 100% of patients on progesterone, I have them use it at bedtime. Okay, and then we're kind of staying on the estrogen and some with a little bit of thyroid questions. So we okay. have a listener who is on the Vival Dot and Lavoxyl. If the dose of one goes up or down, does that affect the other? That's a fabulous question. Um, so first of all, the reason it's such a fabulous question is because there are estrogen receptors on the thyroid, and good levels of estrogen can help thyroid function, um, and vice versa. So this is all over the body. You know, the hormones are like a symphony, and all the different sections need to be playing their best for the whole thing to really sound its best. So, so that's a really great question. So she doesn't have to worry, you know, changing one isn't going to cause a problem with the other, but having good levels of both uh, are going to be important. I did want to say one more word related to the estradiol. Uh -huh. So I like the patches. I think they're fine. I use them with patients of plenty. Uh, I would say more commonly with patients, I use a compounded estrogen gel. And the advantage of that, just for our listeners' information, is that it has estradiol, which is what the patches have. It also has estriol. Estriol balances, it's another form of estrogen. It's the most common form during pregnancy, and it's considered to be one of the reasons that pregnancy is protective against breast cancer <clears throat> because pregnancy is this prolonged release of estriol. So we like to give it in a, we do it as an equal balance, estradiol and estriol in a gel um, that women apply to their skin. So I just wanted to slip that in. Okay. And we have a listener who is trying the progesterone cream, but they're having trouble knowing when to stop because their periods are unpredictable. Do you have any suggestions? Okay. So my experience with my patients is that progesterone, okay, so first of all, natural progesterone is not as not always as potent of an effect on the lining of the uterus. So in terms of controlling the menstrual cycle, that's why women get given birth control pills, which contain a synthetic progestin. However, um, natural progesterone can work if it's in high enough doses. However, it usually has to be oral to make a difference. So again, that's where, you know, if I had her in my office, I'd be taking a really detailed history, and I'd be doing other lab tests, other uh, looking at the reasons for the irregular periods, and, and really talking about that thyroid influences the regular menstrual periods. Um, so, kind of a that that's kind of a it's a great question. It's just a little little beyond our, our scope tonight, uh, but I'll just say that the um, studies show that oral progesterone probably has a more potent effect on the lining of the uterus and uh, could probably be a little more helpful in that setting than the cream. Okay. And we have a listener that wants to know if you have an idea of a dosage for DHEA that's had a total hysterectomy and have severe chronic stress, and they're currently taking 12.5. I'm guessing Excellent. milligrams. So for example, the doses we have are 10 milligrams and 25 milligrams, so you're right in there. I've started women as low as 5 milligrams, or I'll have them take the 10 milligram dose every other day. A lot of ways to do it. It's easy to measure as a DHEA sulfate level. That's a great indication. And DHEA is another hormone that declines as we get older. Uh, it kind of peaks when we're in our early 20s and kind of downhill from there. Uh, so by all means, I think DHEA, and our, our topic tonight is of libido, uh, DHEA is, is a wonderful one to help with that. 
it does metabolize into estrogen and testosterone. And so that's partly how it has its benefits. Uh, and also it can give side effects, such as a little bit of facial hair or acne. For women in particular, this can be a really concerning side effect. However, sometimes if they're really feeling better, it can be nicely outweighed by an improvement in libido and overall feeling of well-being. Okay, I don't want to leave the men out that were joined in, so we do have a question for, for a listener. What should a, a 52-year-old man's total testosterone level be if the range is 129 to 760, 7, 767? Is 220 considered low? Oh, right. I love that question. That's a fantastic <laughs> question. So ah, I knew the questions would be the best part. So first of all, reference ranges are really tricky business. And reference ranges are not to be considered normal range. Reference ranges at labs, so that range that you just read, is a statistical construct. 95% of people tested at that lab fell within those, that range of numbers. The, answer, the short answer to the question is yes. I would consider a testosterone in the 200s to be low. I get asked that question all the time. What do I think is a good number level, uh, testosterone level for men to have? If I had to pick a number, that I think that most men feel their best at, I would pick 600, okay? Now, I've had men who are being seen for other issues, and if their level is 500 and they, they're, they're okay in areas affected by testosterone, then I'm not necessarily gonna recommend testosterone therapy. But I would say 300 or below is really, um, an indication for testosterone to be used for the health benefits. Okay, we got a great question. I think you'll like this one too from a listener. They would like to know, can unopposed estrogen and or DHEA cause weight gain? I do love that question. <laughs> um, so <laughs> the answer is it depends. Um, not usually with DHEA. DHEA helps with metabolism, and it's normally associated with having better results with weight loss. Okay, so that's really for DHEA. Unopposed estrogen, again, so at the level of the cells, estrogen promotes fluid retaining, and progesterone balances that by causing the cells to release fluid, the natural diuretic, okay? So the answer uh, for estrogen is sometimes. Some women can feel joint pain from fluid retention. They don't know it's from fluid retention, but it gives them progesterone and the joint pain clears up. Um, so not precisely weight gain. Usually balancing hormones helps women achieve weight loss. But again, there's that fluid retention question issue, I mean. So we have time for maybe about one more? We one more do. Question. We have a, this one will be a quick question, and then we'll see if we have time for one more good one that I think we have. Um, right. One of our listeners would like to know what is the best day of the month to test female hormones, sex hormones, in relation to our cycles? Excellent. That is a good quick question. So. The answer is that it varies depending on what we're measuring and the reason that we're measuring it. What I personally do is I don't worry a lot about the timing unless we're looking for a particular answer to a certain question like fertility related. Then we want progesterone on day 21, um, FSH and estradiol on day three. So those are a couple of actual answers for that person. But I personally don't worry a lot about it I simply have people go get their labs done, and then I correlate it to the day of their cycle that, that they were on. Uh, I just look at the date of the blood draw and the date of their cycle, and I just correlate it. Makes it easy. Great. 
And we've got one last question. I think we had several people kind of chiming in on this. Yes. And there, it, it has to do with having thyroid problems. And one person said specifically that they have a problem with their teeth. But I think they were leaning more towards um, getting bone loss um, and if taking any thyroid medication can attribute to that bone loss. Hmm. They're saying it's taking T3 caused more bone loss than T straight T3. Well, that's a really big question and kind of not on our topic specifically tonight. Um, the, the association between thyroid medication and bone loss is really more theoretical uh, than actual based on a study of hyperthyroid patients who were found to have lower bone density. Um, but of course, that wasn't from taking thyroid medicine. That was from having too much thyroid hormone uh, in their bodies to start with. So um, that's a, a pretty big question. Um, so there would be a whole lot more I would have to look at with that person. And uh, there's a blood test that can correlate with bone density. <clears throat> um, so that's just a, a little very tip of the iceberg answer for that person. OK. OK, we have time for one more, because I think this one would be very uh, beneficial to some of our uh, listeners tonight, is we have a listener who has had a hysterectomy, and her OB-GYN told her she doesn't need progesterone, that she just needs estrogen. And I think that uh, warrants some, and some uh, recommendations from you of why it's important to have both. Absolutely, absolutely. And we, we did touch on that, and it, I, was, I totally agree, it bears repeating that that is how doctors get trained, is that once there's no endometrial lining that can cause a uterine cancer for estrogen, that she doesn't need any progesterone. And so I see a lot of women who have symptoms of estrogen excess, um, such as fluid retaining symptoms, including joint pain, uh, other types of bloating, that kind of thing, and progesterone, a little bit of a natural progesterone. She doesn't need as much as a woman would need if she had her uterus, but some progesterone can really, really be helpful in terms of balancing the estrogen and also helping with symptoms from a lack of progesterone, like disrupted sleep and anxiety. So yes, this is information that is really well established, but just not taught um, very consistently in regular medical circles, at least not yet. We're working on it. Well, I think that's a good place to stop, Dr. Liz. I think that was a great presentation, and you had a, a great turnout with a lot of great questions tonight, so we really appreciate it. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks to everybody for joining us, and stay connected with us with our newsletters, and uh, we really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny, very much. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. We appreciate you joining us this evening.